This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Dave McDonald. I'm Sam Merciers. And joining us this week are some guests from Fifth House Ensemble. It's a Chicago-based uh, music ensemble, but they do lots of other stuff, so I'm not even going to try and wrap it all up in the intro. We have Crystal Hall and Melissa Snoza. Is yes, that correct? Um, and uh, welcome to the show, guys. Hey, thank you. So I was saying that Fifth House is a, a music ensemble, and um, so I want to get into the and uh, uh, right away because, as Dave can tell you, the outreach and education and stuff like that is one of my big um, things I like to address on the show in regards to new music. And Crystal is the director of educational programming. So we all know you guys do shows, and we're going to get into that. So why don't you tell us about your educational stuff that you guys do? Sure. Um, we do a variety of, of <clears throat> outreach work um, from single-shot concerts to longer-term residencies to um, single workshops and higher ed work. Um, and, and this all grew out of our work with the Chicago Civic Orchestra, all of us, or most of us were members of Civic at one time or another, which um, for those of you who don't know is the training orchestra of the CSO. It's sort of a paraprofessional orchestra that you audition for and get into a uh, really high level playing experience. But they also have Music Corps, which is an outreach arm. And um, one thing I think that we all had in common was that we loved that work and we also weren't satisfied with a lot of the other outreach work uh, that we were doing with the various other organizations and freelance um, sort of like drive-by shows is what I kind of termed them, mm -hmm. where you come in, you know, as a classical musician and you, you share your art and then you leave. And it's novel and it's interesting for the kids in the moment, but you don't give them a point of connection and you don't really leave them with anything other than you know, well, that was a cool experience. Uh, so, you know, my philosophy was that I tried to build um, educational experiences that tied into something, a framework that the kids already had. So, for instance, our very first show was Music Can Tell a Story, where we piggybacked. I mean, it sounds very logical. We, you know, all of us music fans know that, of course, music tells a story. Um, but when you're presenting you know, work by Mozart or Schumann or Brahms to, um, you know, 200 second and third graders, they might just, you know, hear the sounds and not necessarily be thinking about a story. And so you link that to uh, narrative elements that they already know about, and then they instantly have a point of connection. Um, and we do the same thing with our residency work, where we go in for maybe six weeks, eight weeks, 15 weeks, and we sort of layer... Uh, music on something that they're already studying. Hmm. So music and astronomy, music and body systems, music and the circulatory system. You get the idea. That's nice. So was this was the ensemble originally conceived as just a performing group, or was sort of the outreach element and the educational element and all these things were those a part of it from the very beginning? I'll let Melissa answer that one. She yeah. was there at the very beginning. <laughs> yeah, so I'm one of the founding members of Fifth House, and I think that, you know, our basic two things that we decided when we first started the organization was just to say, first of all, we're going to run this as a legitimate organization um, that is thinking long term, and then second, that our point of difference is really going to be bringing music to where people are and creating connections between music and things that people are already interested in, whether it's art forms or um you know, many, many other things. And so education was a natural outreach of that or an outgrowth of that particular thought. We always knew we'd be working in schools. Um, we always knew that we'd be looking for these connections. And I think that as we grew past that original meeting in 2005 or when it was, you know, the, the whole idea of bridging what we do on the concert stage and what we do in the classroom has become a lot more focused such that we're actually doing a lot of the same process with our kids um, that we do when we prepare for our own shows. So that's been a really fun evolution for us to see. Right. Um, so we've, we've alluded to this a little bit. Um, you guys, when you perform, it's not a, a, your usual concert experience. You call yourselves, a, a, what is it, a narrative um, ensemble or something like that? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so, so go ahead. Just just to explain explain what that means. Describe a fifth house show to us. 
Sure. So as I said, we've always been looking for connections between music and things that people already enjoy. And one of those things that we think that everyone loves is a great story. And so um, we've started to explore this concept of narrative chamber music where you take pieces of music and you create a narrative around those things. A lot of times for us that means working with a collaborator. So one really great example of that is our Black Violet series that we did with a graph graphic novelist. His name is Ezra Clayton Daniels. And we just released an iPad version of that project, um, which is available on the iTunes store if you search for Black Violet. And basically what this is like... Sorry. Viva. <laughs> Mild interruption. Um, we've we've basically worked with Ezra to you know decide first of all what music we wanted to play, and we do a lot of new music, but we also don't exclude older music. We actually bridge these things together um, through the storylines that we create, so that you can have really disparate kinds of music on the same show. And um, you know, over the course of these three concerts, Ezra worked with us to create a narrative that spanned all three. Um, that was about black black cats during the last great plague in London. And he did so much research into, you know, the type of language he wanted to use, um, what was going on at the time, and then also the art that he used was inspired by engravings of the time period. So what you end up with at the show is this all-encompassing experience where you're seeing the musicians play live on stage, you're seeing this amazing art and narrative being projected above, so in a sense it's almost like silent film. And we work really hard at experience design, so the whole idea that it's not just the concert and what you put on the stage, but you're designing an entire experience around your audience rather than starting from, um, you know, this is what I want to play, this is how I want to present it, which is definitely part of the conversation. It's got to be an intersection of the two, but I think to exclude what is going to go on for the audience is kind of a mistake. So, um, so you know, a lot of the decisions are made with regards to where we play. So we chose really funky venues for Black Violet um, where people could eat and drink and be merry, and um, the type of merchandise we sold and the types of partnerships we created. <coughs> So, um, so I think thinking about all those things on all those levels um, comes together as a really great experience for our audience to come and enjoy this music and get to know it sometimes for the first time. That's a see. What, that's what really interested me when I uh, I found you guys. We're always looking for interesting guests to have on the show, and uh, I found you guys. And uh, the way the show you describe the show, and you guys sell subscriptions uh, for a concert series, correct? We used to. Um, when oh, we okay. We used to sell subscriptions. In the last couple of years, we've moved towards a completely free model, which is something we've been able to do um, through a lot, a lot, lot of fundraising and through some really great partnerships with the Chicago Park District and the Chicago Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events. So we're actually now performing our shows at the Chicago Cultural Center and also through a variety of venues through the Chicago Park District really looking at trying to get music into some of the neighborhoods where you don't always have a fine arts experience experience every night. That's fantastic. See, to me, I'm always harping on the show about uh, new music being made new in ways other than just, you know, a new harmonic system and new a way to look at rhythm and a new way of sharing music. And uh, the, the fact that you guys uh, sort of sell yourselves as creating this narrative experience, not that that's new, but it's an interesting thing. And the way you're really trying to integrate it to me, that's a great way to try and make music new. Um, and you mentioned Black Violet. That's going to be our pick of the week is a selection from that. Hungry is Far Away by Jonathan Karen. Karen, is that ever pronounced right? And he actually won our Young Composer competition that year. So he was um, a composer who submitted for that competition, and we chose it as our top pick as well. Nice. And we should say, in the interest of full disclosure, you guys, now you guys sponsor the Rapido uh, Composition Contest? We're actually part of the Rapido Composition Contest consortium, if you will. Um, okay. That project actually originated with the Atlanta Chamber Players, and so we host the Midwest region of that, meaning that we choose three participants um, from the Midwest region to participate in the semifinals, which are occurring October 21st at the Cultural Center, and then um, from that, one of those will go on to the national competition in Atlanta. Right. Well, in, in the interest of full disclosure, I did enter the contest, but that was before <laughs> I knew you guys were affiliated in any way, and I probably will not advance so the the issue of whether or not there was any gamesmanship in the system going on I think will be moot. However, I I did enter. Don't even worry. I'm glad that you 
<laughs> but the whole judging process is totally blind. So even if we heard your application, you would have been number 40 or something like that. <laughs> exactly. So if it, it, just in case on the, the far outside chance that I were to win, which is not going to happen, just so people know, there was, no, <laughs> there was nothing strange afoot. You know what I like about you, Sam? I like that you're very optimistic. <laughs> one of my favorite traits of yours. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Um, so, yeah. Uh, so we're going to have that as the pick of the week later. Um, and wh so where does the name Fifth House come from? What's the deal with the Fifth House Ensemble? I have a theory. Oh, oh, tell me your theory. I want to know that first. <laughs> um, well, be <laughs> it, it seems to be related to the fact that you guys are uh, two groups of five, right? Isn't it like a, a woodwind quintet and a string quintet or something together? Does oh it have to do with that? That's so awesome. I never even thought of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally using your creation story. <laughs> All right. It's hard. Uh, so, so here's the thing. Uh, in astrology, the fifth house is the house of creativity and pleasure in the arts. And when we were thinking about what we wanted to do with fifth house, we knew that creating these connections with our audience was going to involve more than just music in terms of the different art forms that were possible. So we wanted a name that would reflect that. And the other criteria was we wanted a name that was composed of real worlds, or real words, not the blah, 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 ensemble, which you have to yeah. spell over and over on the phone. No Latin but, words. Exactly. Yeah. Ironically, when you call somebody on the phone and say, hi, my name is Melissa Snoza from Fifth House Ensemble, I end up having to spell that three out of five times. <laughs> <laughs> Fifth House. It's so easy, it's hard. So yeah. hard. <laughs> yes. So uh, what, what's uh, coming up for you guys? Is there anything big on the calendar for the Fifth House group right now? Absolutely. We have um, a ton of series dates for next year. We're launching our next series, which is going to be very community-based, actually, in the way that it comes out. Um, it's going to be a, a series where instead of us creating the story from front to back, we're actually doing a whole bunch of educational work and outreach work through the park districts to gather stories from the community and bring them together in these shows. So um, our dates at the Cultural Center will be in October and May for that. And we also have a large premiere um, of a work by composer Caleb Burns that's happening at the Museum for Contemporary Art on um, March 9th, I believe. And we're looking at a premiere of a piece by John Zorn on that same program. So it's going to be a really, really great show. Um, we also have a ton of stuff coming up in October. As mentioned, the Rapido competition has the semifinals on the 21st. Um, for those of you who are in Michigan, um, we're looking at something mm -hmm. great for early October, which is yet to be. Uh -huh. Wink, wink. Um, we're also looking at a couple of shows for the Pilgrim Chamber players if you're in the Chicago area on the 25th and 28th. And we'll also be visiting Eastman this year for the um, Arts Leadership Reunion. So um, for those of us, I think Eric and I both went to Eastman, so um, it's going to be a fun homecoming for us. So yeah, nice. a ton of and some travel to Arizona and Pennsylvania throughout the course of the year. So all that information is available on our website at fifth-house.com. Nice. Dave, isn't it awesome? Like you sound like you've done that before. <laughs> a little bit. You everyone. Have that, you have the spiel down. Totally. Da Dave, I, isn't I, it out? <laughs> isn't it awesome when we give every, you know, we want people to plug their stuff and when but oftentimes people will like, "Oh, uh, let's see. I know we're doing stuff. I can't remember the date. Hold on." <laughs> Like, it's so bad that I've plugged things for people. Like, I'll start reading their calendar to them, and they'll go, oh, yeah, that one and that one. So that yeah. was great work. For you. Cheat sheet. <laughs> so what's the uh, – I'm curious, with all these, these education and outreach programs you guys have, what is the, the reaction like – uh, from the audience when you're and, and you, you talked about these uh, school programs that you do and you try to do kind of a longer term thing that has more hooks into the curriculum uh, what's the feedback you get from from the, the people involved in those programs on the other side uh, do you mean the people at the school yeah um, they love it <laughs> they're they're always looking so <coughs> up until the last couple of years, I would say, um, well, there was sort of a big, there's been a big shift. Um, I've gotten to be really plugged into the, the teaching artist community here in Chicago. And I have to say, uh, Chicago has one of the best, most well-developed teaching artist communities, I think, of, of any metro area. Wow. Or, you know, it's up there in the top three, I would say, for this country. Um, 
We're privileged to have organizations like CAPE, Chicago Arts Partnerships and Education, um, who spearhead uh, a lot of research in arts education and arts integration, um, as well as providing teaching artists in the schools. And there's a lot of different organizations. So up, up until a few years ago, um, SHIFT was, was or the arts were, were pretty OK in schools. And then there was this huge shift under a certain president who shall remain nameless <laughs> um, towards standardized testing um, at the expense of the arts. So the arts got cut across the board. And at that point, um, principals and administrators and teachers were very, very concerned with, with getting, you know, not, oh, my cat, not losing funding. <laughs> so, you know, the arts kind of fell by the wayside. And then, of course, what happened was they realized what a negative impact that was having on their students across the board. Um, academically, socially, um, you know, creative, creatively. So then there was this big shift to get the arts back, but at that point the infrastructure had been kind of scrapped. So then it was like the scramble of like, well, just get something in here, just, you know, give us some arts. Um, and then, you know, now they're getting more savvy and it's kind of like, well, we want the arts, but we want it in a meaningful way that's going to sort of help us um, walk that line between doing what we need to do academically and also fostering students uh, creativity so I think that's kind of where we are at this point and that's why we've had such good reception for our arts programs because we really go in as a partnership we really try to support what the teachers and administrators are already doing and what they have done and they're really receptive to that because again it's not like we're coming in and saying here's our art love it it's more like right. this is what we're doing with you to help you and support you. Um, and they see the benefits both socially um, and academically. Yeah, And also just to add a couple of sort of anecdotal things, um, you know, a lot of these projects were working with not only, you know, the most gifted students in the school, but, you know, on, often we're working in schools that are 95% or more underprivileged. We're working with students who have IEPs or like, or you know, learning challenges in certain ways. Um, we're, we're working with classrooms that wouldn't typically get this kind of access. And some of the things that we've seen, um, we've had completion rates on projects go from 40% to 90%, meaning that, you know, before we came into the classroom, 40% of the students would actually get their work done, um, as, as opposed to 90%. We've seen um, students who would not complete a single assignment before, um, come to their teachers and say, hey, um, when can I come in after school and get this done? Or what's the summer reading list? Um, we've seen a lot of students who, you know, at the beginning of the class are like kicking off and just doing weird stuff. And then, you know, we get our instruments out and we start playing. And for them, it's almost the first time that they'll see live music five minutes or five seconds from their face, not coming out of a box. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So yes. it's really cool. And that's, that's, uh, um, it's, we always play at the beginning of our classes because it's a way of, you know, setting the tone for what we're going to do and also sharing, you know, this is what I do and this is what I do on a really high level and so can you. So, you know, there's, there's a lot having to do with that. And I will say one of my favorite things that we did all year, um, this was part of our Fresh Ink Festival, which is a two-week um, new music adventure that we have in Kenosha, Wisconsin that we launched this year where we bring in 12 composers um, from all over the country and then instrumentalists and ensembles to work with us to premiere 24 new works at Ravinia and um, Milwaukee Art Museum and a ton of other places. And, and the whole idea is basically not only creating these new works, but also career development. So giving them everything that we needed in order to start Fifth House from the nuts and bolts of budgeting to how to program creatively and do outreach. And one of my favorite projects of that was a visit to the Boys and Girls Club where Crystal led this composition workshop for I think it was like upper junior high to lower grades of high school kind of age. And when we walk into this room, these kids are, I mean, they're on wheeze. Like they're they're playing video games as we walk in and I'm thinking oh my gosh there's no way that we're going to compete with this <laughs> and um and so they they get the kids over to this little stage area that they have and they're sitting there and sort of like what is going on here kind of thing and um we had participants from Fresh Ink with us I think we had a saxophone player and a toy piano and some composers and a percussionist and you know much other stuff and you know the whole idea was for these kids to get together in groups to draw graphic scores and then for us to interpret them in sound. And 
the composers were each assigned to a group and they were working with them on that. What came out of that was stunning. First of all, not just that, you know, the kids went from being like, I don't care about you and what is going on to, oh my God, check out what I'm doing. And they wrote entire, like, there was a graphic score that was like a visual representation of this horror story graveyard thing with a bizarre Pachelbel cannon moment in the middle. Um, and they're all getting out their camera phones and like watching or, you know, videotaping our performance of this. It was just so cool. And I, I was really impressed with, you know, Crystal and the other musicians on the stage, their ability to engage these kids in such a short period of time um, just by making those connections and being very themselves, you know? That sounds really amazing. Um, Crystal, you brought up the the testing situation and how the arts has been put in this weird position uh, for in, in a and in, in some ways they've always had to justify their existence uh, mm -hmm. in schools, but it has become a lot harder to do, I suppose, with uh, the emphasis on standardized testing. Um, and I think we're as a as a as a group as a large capital a arts community pretty bad at selling ourselves in in that case and i think fifth house seems to be doing a much better job than than certainly anybody that we've talked to on on the show uh but better than than most ensembles that i can think of um and i, I think one of the things that's interesting is that you seem to be uh getting into other kinds of curricula and not just the arts. Is that, is that the case? Yeah. I mean, if you, again, like as I started to engage in the, the teaching artist community at large, um, that was a big thing that was emerging. It was like the, this idea of, of arts integration with the academics. Um, and it's so fun for us. I mean, as, as an oboe player specifically, um, when I teach my oboe students, um, I can't see most of what's going on with them because it's happening in their mouth or in their breath. Um, and so I always think in analogies and talk in analogies. And this was just a natural extension of that, like thinking in analogies of how is chamber music like a solar system or how is chamber music like a body system, um, you know, or how can we extend character creation in... Um, in a piece of music, like, you know, something as obvious as Peter and the Wolf and, and the concepts of leitmotif and timbre, how can we extend that to, let's say, Animal Farm, you know, and how, and the literary devices that authors use to construct their characters versus the, the compositional devices that composers use. Um, and that was a really nice way, I think, for the teachers to also help the students think critically about what they were learning um, and engage them because like I was just telling um, another arts partner recently we were I had a meeting at the cultural center it was a big um, thing at the cultural center where all these arts organizations came together to talk about core curricular standards and the arts um, and I will also just on a side note say that's one way that we're legitimizing the arts is that um, the arts are getting core curricular standards, and they're going to be evaluated just like everything else. So I think that's a good step in the right direction. Um, but I was saying that, you know, Animal Farm in particular may be a little dry for 7th and 8th graders, and that's when everybody reads it. <laughs> and you don't really have an appreciation of how cool it is and how sinister it is when you're in 7th grade. So, you know, suddenly being able to take small percussion and make, you know, a propaganda song or you know, make a light motif for Snowball that's different than the light motif for the the dog, Jesse. Um, and then being able to hear that. Clearly there are students who are going to learn better in that medium, but even if, you know, you have a student who's really academically gifted, all of a sudden they're thinking on multiple levels. And that has been proven to translate really well into testing because a lot of standardized testing now is moving into critical thinking. And, and I love how specific you are when you talk about that stuff, because oftentimes when we talk about um, arts in schools and their value in schools, we're often using kind of these hand wavy descriptions of how it's so great. And like <laughs> we we're, we're very vague and we rely on the person that we're talking to having 
uh, understanding intrinsically some value in this we rely thing, on dogma. In this object and <laughs> well yeah for us you know i mean don't get me wrong i am not against art for art's <laughs> sake at all I, I, nor are we <laughs> i mean i i take that as a given and i take especially if i'm talking to a receptive audience you know i take it as a given that they that they already know and they're they're already at the point that you're talking about where they where they understand the value um, so I don't, you know, feel like I need to talk about that. But if I can give specific examples, um, it really helps people visualize, you know, what what we're doing in the classroom and how it works. Right. right. And the other thing that I'll mention here too is that we've had to learn how to do this over the last few years, um, mostly because we have to have conversations with classroom teachers who teach English and have a very limited time with which to do that. And so we have to say, here's how this project is going to help you with those goals. Here's how we're here to help you and to serve you and make sure that, you know, things are going right for your students. Um, but also because in order to continue to do this work, we have to seek funding. And so our funders are wonderful people and organizations, and they have taught us so much about how to be specific about the benefits that we are providing who we're providing it for, the timeline, and all that stuff. And I think I just gained a new appreciation for that over the last 48 hours because I just served on my first grant panel and read, you know, 70 applications from different arts organizations. And it's amazing what you will see on these things. Like, it's amazing how, you know, as you mentioned, sometimes artists are really great about talking about their art, but um, not really great about following directions or measuring or, you know, being specific about the who, what, when, why, where details that are so important to funders. So you have to learn to be pretty specific and concise about those things. Yeah, right. yeah it, it, it's, I've ex had a lot of experiences where you find uh, people trying to do some sort of arts integration and nothing really happens. It's like they show up, it's like a field trip, you know, or they show up, there's some downtime and there's some fun and then they leave and then and that's it. That's all you get. Um, so kudos. Uh, I have a question about um, uh, what, <laughs> what the word just escapes me, uh, 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 commissioning. Um, and you guys are obviously involved in commissioning, but I was wondering if you have, is, if and how commissioning is integrated with your uh, sort of educational and outreach goals. Oh, that's a great question. You know, um, we actually just started some conversations with a composer who we really love. Um, he is someone who worked with us um, last year at New Music on the Point and also this year at Fresh Inc. And the way that we got introduced to him was that he got up and did a piece with his iPhone. Like literally, just him, four speakers, and an iPhone. And not only was it cool in the sense that he's using a Max MSP patch and like he's, he's creating the whole thing di or directly from his device, but I think if I had closed my eyes and not really realized how he was doing it, I would still have thought the piece was beautiful, and so that really did it for me. And, um, but the reason why that What's was... What's his so, name? Um, Jason Charney, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, Charney. And, Yes, Jason Charney. He's he's awesome, and we actually, as a result of that first um, encounter, invited him to come to the Apple Store with us to perform um, in Lincoln Park in Chicago. And you should have seen all of the um, Apple geniuses stop in their tracks and like watch what he was doing because it was so amazing. But the reason I'm bringing this up in terms of education is that um, I think that a lot of times people have this assumption that new music is going to be scarier for kids, or they're not. And appreciate it or whatever when actually the opposite is really true and um, you know they're they're more open to like weird sounds and like funky ways that sounds can be produced and in some ways those things tend to connect better with them than say Mozart so um, one of the things that was really cool about the potential to work with Jason on commissioning some things for education which we're still in conversations about and I'm looking forward to seeing happen is that um, if we can work with a platform like an iPhone or an iPad or something like that where the kids can immediately produce sound through movement or through in interacting with a program um, that helps to bridge the gap that is one of the main difficulties we face as teaching artists rather than as music teachers and the difference being we're in the classroom for somewhere between five and twelve weeks versus a music teacher over the course of the year and that's too little time to teach somebody to play the clarinet on a really high level 
but it is enough time to be able to teach them to listen, to break apart the parts of music, to connect it to other things, and then if it's an instrument that the kid can get their hands on and make sounds immediately, to teach them to compose and create their own music as well. So, um, so I think involving composers in on the side of being able to create these tools um, and also being able to create music that kids are going to love and appreciate as part of these residencies is a significant part of how we approach it. Yeah, I think you do yourself a big favor by not placing yourself in a position of um, sort of as a, being opposed to technology. You're coming in giving these concerts with uh, acoustic instruments and obviously have a strong, uh, you know, orchestral or band music, you know, these, the way these kids would think about it. You, you, were, you were probably in band, you know, um, but you're not placing yourself in opposition to the idea of using an iPhone as an instrument. Um, or, or trying to disenfranchise somebody because they haven't done the hard work of learning how to play oboe. And, you know, in other words, you, giving them permission to be creative and make something, even if they don't have the time to learn oboe right now, if you know what I mean. Oh, yeah. And I think that's part of the reason why you'll see more teaching artists that are doing this curriculum work who are dancers or singer songwriters or what have you, um, and even percussionists, because that's a really immediate way you can get it. Kid to draw quickly. You can get a kid to move quickly. You can't get a kid to learn how to make reads and play the oboe quickly. Um, <laughs> but so, so I think that's like the major challenge. And so, any solutions we can find along those lines are helpful. Well, it sounds like you guys are doing fantastic work. Um, it's too bad that uh, Nate is not here. You, one of our regular panelists is really into technology and building interfaces for technology and music. Uh, that that people can use without that kind of training and even physical interfaces that work with computers uh, and computer music. So anyway, we'll have to we'll have to make sure he watches this. But uh, let's hook it up. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah, and you guys are close to where Dave is about to move to Florida, so he's not going to be close to you anymore. But uh, but Nate will are... still be right in here in Grand Rapids. Yeah. So awesome. we need to we need Nate and I need to take a field trip. To uh, Chicago sometime. Absolutely. Like yeah. uh, you guys, if you if if Dave were to go out and try and find a guest who uh, focuses on the kind of stuff that I always stump about on the show, you guys would be <laughs> it. So you've made me very happy. A great chamber ensemble. There's other good news in the world of chamber ensembles, though, Dave. You lie, Sam. I don't believe it. <laughs> did you see how I did that there, Dave? I, I did. It was very nice. Take, take it away for us. Well, Chamber Music America has some money, and they would like to share it with some people who don't have quite as much. Uh, and they just last week uh, announced that they were going to be giving a little over half a million dollars to 38 different U.S.-based ensembles and uh, different uh, concert presenters and program uh, managers. So some congratulations to all of those people. I we would we would list them all, but as I said, there are 38 of them, and uh, I don't think it's that <coughs> interesting to talk about a list. But congratulations to all those people, um, and it's awesome that Chamber Music America is has enough support from their private donations and government grants that they can uh, support people that are doing interesting things. Uh, do you have anything you want to add, Sam? No, I mean, we just, that's, I mean, that's one of those. That's pretty just, much it. That's the headline. It's a, it's a new can, music article. You can read details. A new music box article. You, we'll have a link. Um, wow. Speaking Cage of. your favorite person. <laughs> speaking of uh, ensembles that do, uh, that embrace things. technology and do interesting things, um, Alarm Will Sound. There's a review out of their, uh, their last performance of Cage's songbooks. Hey, Crystal and Melissa, have either of you guys gotten to see this uh, Cage performance that Alarm Will Sound has been touring with? You know, I haven't seen that particular one, but I was um, at Eastman with all those guys, and Caleb Burns, the composer we were talking about, about before, is a member of Alarm Will Sound, so we're very well connected. Right. Well, we, we, we had the review on here just because... Um, we I haven't seen a lot of uh, video come out of this yet. I mean, they show some video from their first performance, but they've been getting more and more into it as they go along. And uh, the picture on the the review here kind of spells it out. John Cage is uh, up on the screen with a birthday hat, and et cetera. And somebody's got like a, looks like they're a showgirl in Las Vegas and all kinds of things. So um, we invited our audience, if anyone knew like what this was like, 
to uh, to uh, send us a message and let us know, and we haven't gotten any word yet. But hopefully, the YouTube <laughs> will fill up with uh, some performances of this because I can't and imagine this, that this I can't the, imagine that they didn't document it heavily. This is the performance that we've been talking about all summer, where they've been getting uh, content from the web for right. a lot of things. They've been using Twitter to get uh, like sentence fragments, and they've been having people submit videos. And uh, we, we talked about a, a Google Hangout last week where Alan Pearson was sitting at his desk eating spaghetti with a funny hat. Uh, anyway, so that's all part. This is this whole project coming to uh, a conclusion. Um, so you should definitely read about it. It's a really interesting project that they uh, put a lot of thought into how to integrate all these modern forms of technology and communications into a piece that was composed before any of this stuff was possible, but kind of in, in, in a lot of ways, um, uh, foresaw the kinds, of, the kinds of communities that we would be building with those technologies today. Um, <clears throat> another thing that, that we, we picked up this week is, uh, some, some very cheap recordings of Beethoven. Um, and, I don't know about you guys, but whenever I see cheap recordings of classical music, I know for sure that I'm not going to buy them because they're <laughs> almost universally terrible, right? They're, the, they're usually a little less than... They're, they're usually not as spit polish as what you're going to get out of the New York film. Well, not only that, they're usually uh, performed poorly and sold in gas stations with soothing ocean sounds in the background. Right. Um, Although so, I will say... That one, um, my my oboe teacher at Oberlin, um, who passed away just a couple years ago, um, was a phenomenal, phenomenal gifted player. Played with a short-lived group, the Philadelphia Chamber Orchestra, and his recording of Ravel's Le Tombeau de Couperin, which is sort of the seminal or like the the the, the best recording out there by a lot of oboe players, ended up because of, you know, rights and whatever, on an anthology collection, and a studio mate of mine found it, like, wow. in the 399 bin at one wow. of the, at a record store, and he bought, like, you know, all 12 copies or whatever. So, you know, things like that happen. Yeah. Yep. That's amazing. Well, so this new thing is uh, from, from EMI Classics has released a couple of, of CDs. This is covered in uh, NPR's Deceptive Cadence blog. Uh, there's a collection of the entire Beethoven piano sonata cycle um, for ten dollars, uh, and this is by a young Korean pianist H. J. Lim, who I do not know. Um, she is in this article it says she's twenty four, um, and it also refers to uh, conductor Daniel Barenboim's uh, p recordings of the West Eastern Divan Orchestra. His his kind of pet group of the moment uh of the full beethoven symphony cycle also for ten dollars um and i think it, there are some interesting questions raised here i i don't know if it's if there's something about the technology that's allowing them to make these cheaper or i and i don't know if they're selling physical cds um i guess i guess these are physical cds but um it I'm always concerned that if if we start a price war with everybody else, then it's going to devalue the things that we make, so that everybody's just you know it's a race to the bottom. Not n first with price, but then of course the quality follows. Right. Does that make sense? Yes. So I don't know. Yeah, that's a really hard question. I mean, I know that when we did our first recording, we had to really ask ourselves: Do we want to do physical? We want to do digital. How do we price this thing? Um, and you know, you get conversations from both sides of the fence. Like I remember, we went to a conversation with Mike Daisy, um, and he was talking about how he felt like the arts should be like a library. Wait, and it that Mike awful. Daisy? That Mike Daisy. Oh man. Okay. Sorry. Um, <laughs> and this was before all of the NPR Apple debacle, yeah, yeah, yeah. like by a couple of years. And I have to say, that was one of the best talks that I've ever heard on the subject of the arts is he did such a phenomenal job. He's an incredible storyteller. Sure. Um, anyways, um, that being said, he, his philosophy was that arts should be like a library. 
that everyone should have public access to them, that they should be free, they should be supported by, um, you know, by philanthropists and all of this stuff. And then you get, I think it was Moby who came out recently and was talking about how, you know, the very sort of devaluing of the arts type of thing that you were saying. Um, in, in recent conversations also, like we, we had this wedding business that, um, you know, where we, when we first started, we were like, well, we may as well eat while we do concerts. And so every once in a while, we still get wedding inquiries. And this one bride, you know, when we quoted her a very standard rate for the rate for the wedding was like, well, I can't even imagine. It's outrageous that you would charge this much for something that's ultimately free. <laughs> so um, there are arguments to be made on all sides, I suppose. And I think it's really on how it's done and what, how the story is told of why that price is as low as it is. Because, you know, things can be given out for free that are very high value. It just depends on how. Well, it, it all stems from beginning to trade music using actual capital instead of cultural capital. And, and as soon as you make it into an entrepreneurial activity, all the things that happen to entrepreneurial activity are going to happen to the music business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I'd rather, much rather see a, mo a model that more, gets more back towards community as being something that the community makes and shares together rather than something that is just generated and then you worry about how much you're going to charge for it. Um, but, you know, that's the way I am. <laughs> Speaking of making money from <laughs> all of your all of your hard work as an artist, this is the craziest story I've ever heard. Um, Def, uh, the way Stephen Colbert put it, Def Leppard is now the greatest Def Leppard cover band in the world. <laughs> um, Dave understands this stuff, so he can explain all the licensing I snafus. I don't, but... That for some reason, having to do, we all know, we've all seen behind the music, so we know that rockers live hard and drink and all that stuff, but they always get screwed out of all their money, right? Damn so the man, take it to the streets. Def Leppard <laughs> is no different. So they've got a large catalog of music. Everybody knows Pour Some Sugar On Me and everything else. But they don't, have you ever noticed, I, I try to buy Def Leppard all the time, and I'm always frustrated by the fact that you can't <laughs> get it on iTunes or Amazon or any other digital distribution uh, method, and it has to do with some kind of deal with their record company and blah blah blah. Dave well, can explain that. So, so of course, but, when Def Leppard signed a record contract with Universal in the 1970s, they didn't include anything about digital record sales, and so now they can't come up with an agreement with Universal over how much they should be compensated for digital sales. And uh, that's that's the issue: is that the the two sides can't reach an agreement. And the Def Leppard is, is saying that Universal hasn't even come to them with anything that's even remotely reasonable. Like they, they're, they're not even prepared to negotiate. And so, Def Leppard's to, not interested. To combat this issue, Def Leppard is re-recording all of their albums <laughs> note for note and re-releasing them as a separate uh, CD release. So you can get uh, all of their stuff digital on digital download, but it's going to be current remakes of all of their music. And the way I understand and it, they're doing every song, every album, note for note. I don't know if they're doing every album, but they're doing a lot of stuff. And yeah. uh, so that's that's a, a huge undertaking, obviously. Um, and you know, this is this is under the the license that that everybody has to record cover versions of songs just by paying the the statutory license, the mechanical rights to right. the 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 composers. This is something that's set by law. You can't you can't change it yourself, and it's it's universally granted to everyone. And so, <laughs> Universal can't keep them from uh, Universal can keep them from using their original recordings, but they can't keep them from covering their own music. Uh, so that's essentially right. the 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 legal route that they're taking. Um, should be fun. That is just the fact that the the way things have panned out would lead a rock band to do what they're doing is if you told Def Leppard twenty years ago Steve Jobs is going to end up making you guys have to re-record all of your albums. I don't um, think Steve Jobs is making them do anything. I think Universal EMI and <laughs> well, Sony Steve Jobs and... came up with iTunes and iTunes. Sure gave us the rise of digital download. Stay with me, Dave. Make the connections. Okay. 
I think. Yeah, but I have to. I have to wonder here, like when they say that they haven't gotten a reasonable offer, what precisely does that mean? Because That's they're true. not the only artist on Universal's roster. Um, they've been Universal has to have been doing digital releases many, 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 many times over. I mean, for them to make an unreasonable offer to one band, whereas the offer was reasonable to everybody else, seems a little unlikely to me. So I'm a little curious as to what they consider to be reasonable. Right. I, I mean, I, I think it's, I would absolutely believe that their offer was equally unreasonable. This is the same offer that's given to everybody else. Uh, and it hasn't been fair to anybody else, but the other people just didn't care or didn't understand. That's Maybe. True. I don't know. But you, you, you bring up a good point. Like We don't obviously can't know what the the actual literal offers are and i'm sure it's it's not something that will ever be public um but it's an interesting interesting idea and i'm sure that even without universal um without this problem with negotiation they could have made more money by doing this than they would by re-releasing these old recordings because it th they're doing this on their own, completely on their own. So right. they're not uh, working with a different label, they're just doing it themselves, which is something that is much more possible, I mean, something that would not have been possible at all uh, before digital record sales if you wanted to have your recordings available to anybody. Makes you wonder if some uh, aging rock bands who, uh, after this proves, which I think it's going to to be a very lucrative way of doing business, I wonder if some other people are going to jump on the cover ourselves bandwagon and re-record some of their greatest hits. It's it's tricky because you wonder, you know, this is these are things recordings that were made in the late seventies and eighties. Um, why, like, how can this possibly be? an equivalent recording to the, to those especially for singers i would think you know yeah. 30 years on your vocal cords singing rock music is going to change the way you sound yeah so. billy joel isn't going to go out there and re release piano man and have it sound exactly like it used to i think his <laughs> i think his range has dropped by about a 12th uh since then <laughs> Plus, there's such nostalgia to the way that those recordings right. come out. I mean, it's it's just, it's going to be a completely different thing. But, you know, the thing that they have going for them is that that'll be the only searchable product available on YouTube, or not YouTube, on iTunes. So, yes. you know, um, whereas the advantage to an emerging artist to working with a big label like Universal would be the distribution, you know, they don't really have to worry about it. People are going to be looking for these recordings because their name, they already have that. So there's good potential there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So we'll we'll look for those and and I I anticipate Sam buying the digital box set of the entire <laughs> That's right. Def Leppard release. Is that? I already got a sweet torrent of it pre-release. Yeah. <laughs> no. All right. I would well, never do such a thing. Uh, another quick headline. Uh, if if you haven't heard this yet, Ralph Jackson, who if you've this is a little bit of an inside baseballish story. So if if you're not uh, a performer or a composer in, in our audience, I apologize. Uh, Ralph Jackson uh, has been at BMI for decades. He is now retiring. He, he was the vice president of BMI, one of the two big uh, licensing organizations in the United States uh, since, uh, I don't know, he's been there since the 79, I think, but uh, he was the vice president for classical music and he was also president of the BMI Foundation which does all kinds of great work in outreach and education and all kinds of programs to support composers and uh, such as a uh, young composer contest right, such as such as the BMI student composer competition that Dave won I did it like 6 years ago win one um and I met Ralph at that presentation. He's like the nicest person you could ever want to meet. So uh, everybody in classical music circles, especially people that work with BMI, know Ralph. And I've never heard anybody say a bad thing about him. Um, so congratulations to Ralph. And I hope he enjoys his retirement. Uh, get get some some fantastic painting done. Ralph actually got into BMI through his uh, work as a composer he doesn't write a lot of music anymore but he's a really interesting uh, artist he, he does beautiful paintings 
Um, and there's, in fact, uh, a photograph of one of those paintings in the New Music Box uh, article this week. So you should definitely check that out. John Luther Adams, uh, composer, wrote a really interesting, uh, a really great kind of... Uh, Appreciation. Almost a thank you letter to to Ralph for his many years of service to the industry. Um, Sibelius, we talked about this last week and the week before, and I hope we don't have to keep talking about this every week. Sibelius, uh, Avid, the company that owns Sibelius, the music notation program, not Sibelius, the uh, Finnish composer, um, is shipping off the development of Sibelius to some country where development of software is much cheaper than it is in the UK. And the development team is really upset about this, as you might imagine, including uh, the Finn brothers who founded Sibelius, who created Sibelius, uh, and they released uh, an official statement this last week about the situation. And it, it just, it, it breaks my heart to hear these stories. They tried to buy back Sibelius from Avid. They wanted to like bring it back in house and develop it again with their own team and Avid uh wasn't having any of it. The story is according to this statement, uh Avid is cutting costs on Sibelius to make up for losses in other departments and Sibelius itself is still profitable. So we hope that this can be resolved soon though it seems according to this uh statement that uh there's there's no amount of convincing that will get avid to change its mind so you know we we addressed this last week a little bit uh, when we were talking about that but uh, we were talking about you know education earlier and and using a platform that exists like an iphone um it's interesting that those those things are very convenient but when um, something that's not a standard, something that's just one product that has become so ubiquitous that it's almost like the standard, um, like Photoshop as an example. You know, if Photoshop were to disappear tomorrow for some reason, um, that would be bad all over the world. And, uh, you know, Sibelius, well, Sibelius is something... Sibelius isn't disappearing. It's just going to be right, not developed it's gonna... by the people that created it. Right, but it's just that's one of the things when you rely on uh, when one product becomes that ubiquitous, you know, like... Yeah. You could you could make the stere the, the the characterization that about fifty percent of composers use finale and fifty percent use Sibelius, you know, and then well and then there's that point zero one percent of people that use that engraving program, whatever it is. Okay, so it, anyway, I don't know if we need to burn this anymore, but no. uh, that that horse is beaten dead. Um, do you want to talk about this Chrome Web Lab, or you want to save it for next week, Sam? I want to save it for next week when when Nate is here. All right, we'll we'll save this story. You should check out the. In the meanwhile, you should check out the Chrome Web Lab. They've got a really cool project uh, that you can participate in crowdsourcing uh, music again uh, in some really interesting ways using some really interesting new web technologies so that you can collaborate with people from all over. Uh, we'll talk about it next week though. Instead, Sam just left for reasons passing understanding. But uh, we're going to talk about our pick of the week. Sam, do you have a do you have a, a, an audio cue? Is that why you left? Maybe. The pick of the week. <laughs> <laughs> that that worked actually. Congratulations. Sam's been trying for like a month to make that work. It's worth all the effort, trust me. <laughs> that was the payoff, stunning. The payoff was rapturous. <laughs> Okay, so Sam, why don't you introduce this? Uh, the pick of the week is uh, Hungry is Far Away. Is that the name of it? Yeah. Yeah. Hungry, and is this mean hungry as in the country hungry? Yes. Okay, so this is, uh, why don't you guys set this up for us a little bit? Um, this is uh, Hungry is Far Away by Jonathan Kieran from, what was the name of the the larger project? Um, um, Black Violet. Black Violet. So why don't you set this up for us? Yeah, this is, um, again, I mentioned this was a piece that won our Young Composer competition that year. And, um, you know, the way that we used it in the show was nothing to do with what Jonathan originally <laughs> envisioned, actually. Um, I think that there was some text that went along with it that he was, that he was thinking of when he wrote, wrote this piece. But um, we chose it because it was so incredibly well constructed. And then you hear this these really fun textures going on in all of the instruments and then this horn is playing this really really simple melody so um, we used it I think in sort of a creepy into the woods kind of scene um, in Black Violet. Nice. Cool. 
So here's just a, a little excerpt of that, uh, and we'll have a link to where you can find a recording of the whole thing. Uh, again, this is Hungry is Far Away. So that is, again, an excerpt from Hungary is Far Away, uh, performed by uh, the Fifth House Ensemble. We have two guests today from the Fifth House Ensemble. Thank you so much for, for sharing that with us. This is really, a really cool recording. Thank you. Um, wh one of the things I, I, I like about it is that the, the, the parts, there's so many uh, voices in, in the opening section, and they seem at the beginning to almost be ignoring one another. Um, and then gradually it, it's as though, the, this, oh yeah, there are other people playing as well. And like pulling in one after the other, little pi little pieces from, from one another until they, it, they are playing uh, larger ensemble stuff toward the end. Uh, it's a really interesting kind of evolution that occurs over, over the course of the piece. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a big fan of that mode of operation, kind of building up your content instead of starting and then deconstructing, like starting with nothing and just add your content and shake the bag a little bit as you go. Shake I like that, bag. shake the bag. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's like you're uh, making shake and bake. Yes. Totally. The horn player is the cutlet in this. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Nice. <sighs> Yeah, yeah I remember listening thing. to it for the first time and thinking, what is the horn player doing? It's like playing a totally different piece. And then yeah. it goes through and it's like, oh, it makes sense. It's all good stuff. Yeah. I, you do. It, it's, I, I, I'm a fan of pieces that can sound that sort of like, you know, uh, hard to grasp at first, but then aren't afraid to give you something that's nice. I mean, there's some, there, later on, there were some, you know, finger quote, nice sounds that just about anybody would find appealing. And I'm glad that he didn't shy away from sounding that way, even though at, at open it sounds, you know, dark and scary. And it's funny that you guys didn't use it for it. Uh, one of my big pet peeves, and I think Dave's too, is that people, music can be used to for narrative uh, reasons, but music, just some music with nothing else doesn't tell a story, you know. You can tell a story in your mind, um, and it works well in that capacity. But when people say, oh, the music does this or it does that, it, the fact that you guys like completely pulled it out of whatever the composer had in mind and used it for your own purposes is, to me, a cool, a cool thing because it has the, the ability to push a narrative, but it is not in, in, in and of itself a narrative structure, no matter well, what people try and tell you. It's great to hear you say that because honestly, that's one of the places where we're polarizing, like where there are going to be some people who say, you know, that's my piece and, you know, they're going to throw rotten tomatoes at us for not using it exactly the way they want it. I mean, on the same program, on that same Black Violet program, there's another piece by another composer who was the honorable mention in that competition. Um, it was Greg Simon, a piece called Kites at Seal Rock. Actually, that's the movement. The whole piece is called Scenes from Childhood. And you had a totally different thought in mind that was actually narrative based than what we used it for mm -hmm. but you know our, our purpose in doing this is really that we have to come up with a character or a story or something in order to develop a unified um, vision for what we want it to sound like in our rehearsal process and we're just giving our audience a snapshot of that in real time instead of like getting up at the beginning and saying you know in about 10 minutes set your stopwatch there's going to be this really awesome moment so remember that um, right. you actually see it happen over the, and it's just a suggestion for what you could be seeing in your mind too right and this actually um, this feeds into what we do in our educational work because you know we're always teaching kids 
not teaching kids, but we're always encouraging kids to explore how um, you can interpret music differently than the composer interpreted the music. So we talk a lot about programmatic music, and then we take it out of the context of whatever programmatic world it was written in and encourage the kids to interpret it themselves. And in that way, they start to take ownership of it. So like for our concerts, we always say, you know, we're showing the audience our vision, but it's totally fine if you have your own vision of what story this piece is telling. But here's a, a point of departure. Right. And, and I'm curious about how you lead your audience through this story, because there's kind of a there's a huge gamut of ways to use music in storytelling there there's something very deliberate like peter and the wolf or an opera or a ballet and then there's you know like a few sentences in the program notes or something um and i'm curious how you uh in a performance uh, or even on this recording put your story together around this music yeah, so the process is actually really cool, and Ezra put together this um, video specific to Black Violet that cool. outlined exactly how this was done. But basically, all of the story points, you know, the, the creation of this process was very much like a game of ping pong, where we come up with a piece that we might, or a few pieces we might like to do. Ezra comes up with a large-scale um, idea of what story he might like to tell. We start to break these into scenes, and one thing I should mention about this is that um, we present multi-movement works generally in order, but not constant or not in sequence. So you know you might get a movement of this, and then a movement of a different work, and then a movement of that, and it goes back and forth the way that you might see drama drama go back and forth in a movie or on a TV show. Um, so that helps to build the narrative as well. But everything that we do from a narrative perspective is tied to specific cues in the music. So when Ezra was doing this, and he's not a classical music person by any stretch of the imagination, he listened to these things very carefully and put marks on you know, his score of where emotional cues took place and what they were, and then he built the narrative directly around that. So mm -hmm. when we do this live, um, we're not playing to a click track or anything like that. We have a projectionist who's sitting in the back of the hall with the space bar and a score and who watches the score and makes sure that all of these moments happen precisely where they should. Um, and so when you see this, it's very much like film score, except that the piece wasn't written to the story. Um, the story and the music were chosen to feed each other. So it's very collaborative in that way. Excellent. Okay. And what, what's, the, uh, what's the feedback that you get from composers when um, you, you include their works in these, kind, in these kinds of presentations? You know, as I mentioned, that is a polarizing issue. I've had, <laughs> like, for the most part, it's great because they're seeing their music be programmed in completely different ways and they're getting it in front of new audiences in formats that are not what they would usually expect. So I think that on that side, it's really a plus. I've had maybe one or two people say, gosh, I never imagined that this would be the way that you would use my piece. And it sort of ends there. <laughs> and it, that's fine, <laughs> you know, but like, you know, it usually comes with a lot of opportunities or the opportunity to record and a ton of other things that are, um, in addition to that, really great. So, you know, I think on the whole, people have been really, really open-minded, which has been great. I, I mean, nice. I think as a composer, if somebody took my music and did anything at all with it, I would feel, uh, I mean, I guess I would, I would feel excited that my music had inspired somebody else's creativity. <laughs> and that had made them think of some other creative project. I think that would be very exciting to me. I don't, I don't know. What do you think, Sam? I think getting my music performed, period, is a pretty exciting thing. <laughs> you know, I'd be like, I don't care how you use it if you're going to program it. Can I sell T-shirts at the concert? <laughs> you know? Yes, you can. Awesome. And, uh, you know, the, the thing is that, um, the other thing that's cool is that even if we're not hearing the exact storyline that the composer had in mind, the fact that we're hearing a lot of the same emotional cues and perhaps interpreting them into different characters um, means that they've done their job really well, you know, and we don't right. program things that don't connect with us emotionally or don't have that sort of dramatic push that we can hear from just from listening. So, um, so I think that that's definitely a marker of them having constructed an incredibly effective piece. Right. Have you ever done, like, uh, used a sample of someone's piece? Like, you chop it up a little bit and use it that way? Because that might, I might feel differently about that. You know, um, 
Not really. It's if we take anything out of the piece, it's generally like an entire movement. Like for instance, the Simon was a movement out of a larger work, um, mm -hmm. and we spoke to him about that before we did it. Um, mm -hmm. But you know that happens sometimes. But I don't think we necessarily have taken chunks of things and repurposed them. Yet. Right. <laughs> so I, I uh, for myself, I think you guys. One of the next things you should do is work with a filmmaker and make a, a video, do a video project that has. You know, not still images, but is time synced live music with film. I think that would be awesome. It's way on the table. And also, um, the next evolution of Black Violet is to animate it. So, um, ah. we're just about that prospect, I know as we're working hard. Yes. Well, uh, anything you have, I mean, we're of course going to put links to all the things you mentioned, uh, but anything else, let us know because uh, I'm a fan and we will plug it on the show. And our tens of fans will know all about you. <laughs> Delight. All ten of you are such pretty people. Thank you so much for watching. <laughs> well, I think that's a great place to leave it. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Uh, and and Melissa has uh, given given you as many performances as 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 you could possibly want to attend uh, over the next few months. Uh, so we'll ha again, have links to all of those things in the show notes. Uh, and if you'd like to read any more about any of the topics that we've covered, including all of the great projects of fifth house ensemble, you can do all of that and more on our site, soundnotion.tv slash SN to get to this show. Um, we also, if you uh, would like to be a part of the show live, we also stream this show on Sunday mornings around 11 a.m. ish Eastern time. And you can join us in chat if you have any questions for our guests. You can share them there. Any comments? Uh, we certainly take most of your time sharing with you our opinions, and we would love to hear what yours are on the subject. If you're reading this after the fact, you can leave a comment uh, on our site, or you can connect with us on Facebook or Twitter. We're at Sound Notion on Twitter. Uh, we're all individually on Twitter as well. This show and all our shows are available in the iTunes store, so be sure to go there, subscribe for free, and uh, get every episode downloaded automatically to your computer or mobile device. Um, Sound Notion's introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again for watching, and we'll see you back next week.